Good afternoon and welcome to the North American Vascular Biology Organization's premier webinar. Today's webinar is sponsored by Angiogenesis, a Springer Nature Journal. We're pleased to welcome our speaker, Andine Cleaver, who will present her work entitled GTPase Regulation of Actomyosin During Blood Vessel Tub Tubulogenesis. Today's talk will be a more in-depth version of her presentation at the Engineering Vascular Morphogenesis Session at Vascular Biology 2017 in Monterey this past October. Much of the presentation will refer to her article in Angiogenesis, RAS IP1 is essential to blood vessel stability and angiogenic blood vessel growth. A link to the abstract of the article is included in the program materials. If you have a subscription to angiogenesis, you will have access to the full text. Throughout the webinar, you will be able to switch between the phone audio and the computer audio in case you're having a problem. You can see this information on the audio section of the GoToWebinar control panel. If you experience technical problems, please click on the Help tab at the top of the control panel. Scroll to the bottom of the Help screen for the technical support phone number. I'd also like to introduce Caitlin Brach, also from UT Southwestern, who will monitor today's questions. Questions will be handled in two ways. Throughout the presentation, you can type your questions into the question box in the control panel. Your questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. At the end of the question and answer period, provided there's time, if you have a question, please raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon on the left-hand side of your control panel. I will recognize you and your mic will be unmuted. You will then be able to ask your question live. This webinar is being recorded and archived on the NAVBO website for future use. The Cleaver Lab is part of the Heyman Center for Regenerative Science and Medicine, or CRSM. Her lab studies cell fate and how cells assemble into tissues. Her group is particularly interested in intracellular signaling events that drive cytoskeletal or adhesion changes within progenitor cells, allowing them to assemble into functional tissues. She focuses on blood vessels and on developing organs such as the pancreas, the kidney, and the lung, and is interested in how cues in the microenvironment drive vascular assembly or growth, and how blood vessels turn, in turn communicate paracrine, non-nutritional signals to stem cell niches. Please welcome Dr. Cleaver. All right, hi everybody. Um, thank you, Linda. That was a really nice introduction and, and describes well what we're interested in what we do. Uh, and I wanna thank you all for being here, even though I can't see you or hear you. Um, I'm, I'm glad you're here. And this is our first NAB, NAVBO webinar. So don't hesitate to ask questions um, by the methods that were just described to you. So what I'm gonna take you through today is really a part of the work that we're doing in the lab. Um, we focus really on trying to understand the basics of how cells find each other and assemble together to make functional tissues. Um, and in particular for this talk, uh, we're gonna talk about blood vessels. So the title of my talk is GTPase Regulation of Actomyosin During Blood Vessel Tubulogenesis. Uh, in brief, that really just means uh, a how the cells are going to get together to make a blood vessel. So on the first slide, what you'll see on the left-hand side is an early mouse embryo. And there's a, a lot of green vessels that you can see there, but there's two in particular, which are the progenitor vessels to the dorsal aorta. And what we're going to discuss is really how those first blood vessels form. And on the right-hand side are pancreatic tubules. and what I just want to mention in this opening slide is that there's an amazing amount of uh, similarities between how cells form tubes in, in multiple different cell types. And we have found in particular that this control of the cytoskeleton and cell adhesion, cell polarity, um, is done in a really similar way between endothelial cells and epithelial cells. Lots of similarities. Of course, there are differences. As you can see by the little cartoons there, the cells are different uh, endothelial cells are, are, are much more flattened. Uh, their junctions are, 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 are very thin. Um, in epithelial cells, they're much thicker, but today we're gonna focus on the endothelial cells um, and about the molecules that are required for this event to occur. 
So just to open up by saying, why do we care about blood vessels? Obviously, we would like to be able to grow them in certain cases, and we would also like to be able to suppress their growth in other cases. So what I'm showing you here is an example of tissues where we'd like to be able to grow blood vessels. And there's, for instance, in a myocardial infarct, when uh, a blood vessel becomes occluded and tissue dies, uh, and we are learning now to regenerate tissues, but if you regenerate tissues, you still need to learn how blood vessels can be encouraged to grow into that new tissue. So that's part of our interest. In other cases, uh, there are tissues where we would really like to be able to suppress their, their growth. Um, and I show you a few examples here, including I, an example I'm familiar with, diabetic retinopathy, uh, where blood, vessel, blood vessels overgrow and really um, mask your vision. Another example is tumors, where blood vessels grow into those tumors, and it sure would be nice to be able to suppress that uh, to block off nutrition and gas exchange and roots for metastasis uh, for tumor cells. So in either case, this is uh, within the scope of uh, what we're interested in the lab. Let's see here. I am having trouble with advancing the talk. Oops. Um, let's see, I'm going to have to do something here to try and get it offline and back on. Sorry about that, everybody. Like I said, this is our first uh, attempt at a webinar, so we have little technical things to work out, but here we go. We're back online. Okay. So we use in our lab uh, the early embryo as a platform for understanding blood vessel development. Um, and the reason that we like it is that it's a very stereotyped. We know where every blood vessel is forming. Um, we can predict uh, where it should be. And so therefore it makes it a nice platform for uh, revealing um, any deviations from normal, either via genetic manipulations or pharmacological manipulations. And so here I'm showing you an embryo that could be a mouse embryo or a human embryo, um, but the vessels that you're seeing in red are the arteries and in blue are the veins. And you can see how there's a number of circulatory loops either through the head or through the tail or through the yolk sac uh, where blood is pumped from the heart into the arteries and back into the veins and back to the heart. And so we are interested in particular in how the cells form this basic plumbing of the early embryos. How do endothelial cells assemble? Um, how do they know inside of tubes from outside? Uh, in, in other words, their polarity. Uh, how do they recognize each other at their junctional sides? How do they rearrange relative to each other? All these things are of interest to us. And so we will be discussing today uh, the basics of this endothelial cell behavior and morphogenesis uh, into blood vessels. And in particular, we're going to focus on um, really how this happens inside the cells and how cells communicate with each other. And so we have become interested in uh, cell adhesion, um, how one cell attaches to the other cell or attaches to the outside world, to the extracellular matrix. And uh, this image here really shows you how nicely each one of these uh, junctional adhesion points uh, is tethered to uh, the rest of the cell via this actin or, or sometimes microtubule cytoskeleton. But point being, these junctions are, are anchored um, and the anchoring of those junctions is highly regulated and that's uh, part of what we're gonna discuss today. So here's an example of early blood vessel formation in the mouse embryo. And so what you're looking at here are four panels of uh, early embryos. And in green, uh, you're looking at the reporter uh, for the gene FLIC1 or VEGF receptor 2. Uh, this is a receptor tyrosine kinase that binds to vascular endothelial growth factor. And this growth factor receptor pair are really important in blood vessel development and maintenance. Um, in the embryo and beyond into the adult. But point being this reporter shows you the presence of both uh, blood vessels and their progenitors called angioblasts. Uh, in the first panel labeled one somite um, is really the beginning of embryogenesis. At this point, the embryo doesn't have any organs. It only has the beginnings of a cardiogenic plate and a little bit of the neural folds. But what you're seeing in the middle in that sort of dark region there um, are the progenitor endothelial cells being born within the mesoderm. And they're appearing and they're proliferating in number at this point and they're migrating like little amoeboid cells 
actively feeling their microenvironment extending philopodia uh, and they're lining up uh, into two linear aggregates and you can see that at the two somite stage where these cells are starting to assemble at the three somite stage now these endothelial cells under um, the influence of cues in the microenvironment have really lined up now into what we call cords and these cords uh, do not have a lumen uh, they are more like ropes and eventually the cells within these cords will rearrange um, until a, a lumen forms and you can see that in the right hand panel at the five somite stage um, so that's we're interested at every stage of this uh, process whether it be uh, acquisition of endothelial cell fate patterning of these cells into prospective blood vessels um, but in this talk, we're going to focus on the transformation of these cords into tubes. Um, this really what, what is listed here, the stereotype formation of the dorsal aorta. So here's just a close up of that. So I want you to know what it kind of looks like. This is really in whole mount. And I failed to mention earlier, but uh, part of the big green blob that you're kind of seeing at the top is, is just because there's so many blood vessels and that is uh, the yolk sac, which is actually continuous with the embryo at this stage prior to the embryo turning uh, to the gut tube closing and to really these connections uh, becoming the umbilical cord and all the vessels in the umbilical cord. But at this early stage, uh, the embryo is more like a cup shape and the entire embryo is continuous with that yolk sac. So that's why it looks so green. But we're going to focus on the dorsal aorta in this talk, which are these two parallel uh, cords and then as they open up lumens, two parallel tubes. So here's just a close up on one of those aorta. Um, and in this process, we're seeing uh, three sets of panels, angioblast migration, cord formation in the middle column, and then tubular genesis on the right hand column. And uh, under the top panels, you can see now whole mount view, which is very similar to what you saw in the previous slide. You can see these angioblasts migrating around. And then the bottom panels, uh, you can see a cross section of this process. And you can see these endothelial cells now uh, sort of separated from each other, uh, but they're migrating around. Um, and then they assemble, they find each other, they adhere, and they form, as you can see in the cartoon down below, this cord. Uh, which is really just a linear aggregate of these endothelial cells uh, adhered to each other. At some point, uh, they transform. They, it, it does so actually in a wave from anterior to posterior. They start to open up these lumens. And this process really is a matter of the junctions that have formed between these endothelial cells moving out of the way. Uh, to be able to open up the central lumen and they have to move to the periphery of the tube so i've kind of false colored here on the screen you'll see it in red uh, these junctions and that could be either adherence junctions uh, like ve cadherin or tight junctions like zo1 but point being they've they've got to clear the apical membrane and that's the process we're going to look at in detail today so everything that uh, i'm going to tell you about really started uh, back in my postdoc in doug melton's lab uh, where I was allowed to do the screen uh, for genes that were expressed in early blood vessels. And I've boiled it down here to a couple of panels showing you the early embryo that we took these tissues from. Um, and we took a number of different tissues, the endoderm, the somites, the epithelium uh, overlaying the entire embryo, the neural tube. But we also peeled out the dorsal aortae and we compared all these many tissues. It was a huge microarray screen with over 55 microarrays. And what was interesting about the long lists of genes that came out of the screen was that almost everything in the early aortae were GTPase effectors. And this was a surprise to me as a developmental biologist. I'd kind of hoped this screen would uh, result in some transcription factors or growth factors and receptors. But everything was really in the cytoplasm, and it was these GTPase effectors. Um, and so once again, I'm so sorry. Something's happening. Uh, it stops me from being able to proceed, but I'm just going to jump in and out. Here we go. I think I'm allowed to proceed now. So. Out of this list, 
Uh, I'm showing you a number of factors that came through, uh, these GTPA effectors. Um, I'm showing you, it's a number of panels, but the top panel is all whole mount in situ hybridization of day eight and a half embryos. Then in the middle panels, there's a cross section through one of the dorsal aortae, showing you the endothelial cells uh, expressing a lot of these factors. And then the uh, panels down below are a day later in development at day 9.5 in whole mount. And what this slide is supposed to show you is just uh, the, the, the top hits on this list and the fact that all of these effectors uh, are related to either rho GTPases or to RAS, RAP, CDC42. Um, and so this is where we really became interested and said we can't avoid thinking about these early GTPases. And it was interesting because the GTPases themselves, such as rho, RAC, RAS, CDC42, RAP, were all they're all ubiquitous. So if you look at their expression, they're ubiquitous. However, uh, the GTPase effectors are tissue specific. Uh, some of them stay, some of them go away. Uh, not many of them were uh, completely restricted to endothelial cells, but we got really interested in one that was, and it's uh, this RAS IP1, which is in the uh, title, I think, of, of, the, of the talk. But we're gonna focus on RAS IP1 as one of the examples of these GTPases and take a really good look at, at what it does within these endothelial cells. So here's just a close-up of RAS IP1. RAS interacting protein one, and it is expressed uh, in a conserved manner throughout different species. You're looking at a frog, a mouse, and a zebrafish on the left-hand side, and uh, it's endothelial specific. And so in fact, in animals that lack all endothelial cells, mutants that lack endothelial cells, there's no expression. So this really piqued our interest. Was this factor going to be important in early blood vessel formation? There was very little known about it. And so in the middle, I'm showing you a panel uh, from a paper from Natalia Mitten at UNC Chapel Hill. And she was a RAS person and she pulled this out uh, from a used to hybrid screen and reported uh, its finding. It was a novel gene at the time. And on the top of the screen, what you're looking at is the, the, um, the protein domains within RAS IP1. And it has a RAS interacting domain or RA domain, a forkhead domain, which is really protein protein domain, and then a dilute domain. And this domain is really intriguing to us uh, because it has myosin five like domain similarities, motifs, um, and it's also thought to potentially bind uh, uh, vesicles. Um, and that's something we're really interested in. But so but there was no known function and that was what was interesting to us. So Kurzu, who's pictured here, um, my graduate student at the time, took on uh, the analysis of a potential function for RAS IP1 in blood vessels. So on the left-hand side is uh, just a reminder of its expression. It's really endothelial specific in mouse in this case. Um, and on the uh, top of the slide to the right is that one of the first experiments he did to just ask the question, is it important? And what you're looking at in panels uh, C and D are um, what happens when you plate monolayers of endothelial cells on matrigel? And endothelial cells in culture will just kind of spontaneously form these plexus-like structures. Um, and so I'm showing you a, a, a control that's been untransfected uh, in D uh, is a control siRNA. And then in E is when we knocked out the function of RAS IP1 and you can see that it's really affecting the endothelial cells. They don't like when RAS IP1 is gone. But at the time we didn't really understand uh, what was going on with those cells, but clearly they needed it uh, in some sense. In F and G, what we're showing you is that now rather than in vitro, we asked the question, is it important in vitro? In F is the uninjected side where we're looking at a close up on blood vessels in an early frog embryo. And what you're looking at, uh, PCV is the posterior cardinal vein, ISV are the uh, intersomitic uh, vessels. And in G, what you're seeing is the injected side of the embryo. Um, and in various ways, uh, the blood vessels have been messed up. Uh, the plexus was disrupted, the ISVs were gone. You kind of can see a little tube forming right there and that's actually the pronephros, but the endothelial cells are no longer lined up. So this meant that um, somehow RAS IP1 was really critical for blood vessel formation. 
Um, so we did the experiment in mouse and we just knocked out RAS IP1 in mouse and this was the result. Uh, RAS IP1 appeared to be required for blood vessels. Uh, when we pulled out day 10 embryos, uh, this is what we saw. It was one of the first experiments we did. And what you're looking at actually is a, a little embryo uh, inside of its yolk sac. And over the yolk sac, you can see all of these blood vessels coursing on the left-hand side in the heterozygote uh, sibling. You can see a shadow of the embryo underneath that yolk sac. But it, what's important here are these large and small vessels throughout the yolk sac. And those you cannot you could not see them um, in the homozygote mutant RAS IP1 null embryo and the or its yolk sac and so the embryos died of severe cardiovascular failure uh, and edema and you see an example of that embryo here very retarded in growth uh, but this got us really excited about what was going on at first we thought maybe the vessels were not there but they were um, but they were doing something very wrong and what they were doing very wrong was that. Um, they were not opening up a, co a coherent, uh, continuous lumen. And so here's just some cross sections through those early dorsal aorta. And on the left-hand side, you see an early stage aorta. Um, on the top bottom, you see a late stage aorta. It's getting bigger. There's more endothelial cells. And in the RAS IP1, there did, seemed to be no problem in proliferation. There was no problem in patterning. However, they, they never acquired this beautiful open central lumen. And we had a nice paper that I won't go over today, but, but a developmental cell paper in 2011, uh, in which we concluded that RAS IP1 was critical for cell shape. Um, and you can see that these angioblasts, these, these early endothelial cells remain really cuboidal in the mutant. And they also lost adhesion to uh, the outside stroma that surrounds it. And, and the stroma will actually open up a hole, uh, but the endothelial cells are no longer stuck to the walls of that hole. And then, so they stay kind of in this cord-like uh, conformation. And so they, the reason that they stayed in this uh, closed conformation, never opened up that lumen, uh, became clear and then when when we published this paper and it was the fact that uh, they never cleared the junctions from the apical membrane a process that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk was really critical for for lumen formation so here what I'm showing you in this slide is a, a RAS IP1 heterozygote uh, in this particular cord there's three endothelial cells shown in cross section and what you're looking at is shortly before it's opening up or as it's opening up the lumen you can see that the red junctions, which is Z01 labeled on the left, far left-hand side, has uh, cleared away from the, the luminal membrane. And so you can see the luminal membrane in green um, as marked by podocalyxin, which is uh, something that is brought to the apical surface and deposited on the, the apical surface. So they've segregated. The apical membrane is seg segregated from the lateral membrane. However, in the RAS IP1 nulls, uh, you can see now that the apical membrane seems about in the right place. However, uh, the junctional membrane is, is overlapping with the apical membrane. And so you can see red on top of green. You can also see red basally. It's all in the wrong place. Um, and so we became really interested in what is the process of getting uh, those red junctions off of the apical membrane. And so I'm gonna show you this process in a little bit more detail. I'm gonna go ahead and just show you all the panels. And now what you're looking at in the top panels is the process of uh, um, when the endothelial cells are adhered to each other. And as you go down and you can see that labeled on the left-hand side, uh, the closed lumens or they've never opened are starting to open. And so what they need to do at this point is clear those junctions. So in the middle column, you can see VE cadherin in green. So we've kind of switched colors here, but um, at first in the top panels, it's across this podocalyxin apical membrane. And then as you go through the process of lumen opening, those VE cadherin spot welds essentially get out of the way. They clear the way and then a lumen opens. And here I've kind of outlined it with a little dotted line. So I represent that here with this cartoon, just showing you this is what needs to happen. Somehow these uh, junctions are moving away from the apical membrane. So the question is, how is that happening? Why is that happening? So at this point, I just want to go back to um, what RAS IP1 is, this RAS interacting protein. It's an interesting protein. There is no RAS IP1 2. Um, it's, uh, there's just one of them. Uh, and it's not really similar to very much, but it is similar to one protein called a FADN. Uh, and so here I've kind of lined up the protein 
uh, from uh, RAS IP1 and Afadin to show you the major motifs within the protein. And what you can see is that they share some motifs, this RA domain, the 4 kit association domain, and the dilute domain. Afadin has a few extras, but we could glean a little bit about what RAS IP1 might be doing by looking at Afadin. And Afadin in the literature is really known for being a scaffolding protein. And on one end, it, it it was bound to nectins, and nectins are cell-cell adhesion molecules. And on the other end, it was bound to uh, the actin cytoskeleton. And what Afadin kind of did was to catalyze uh, the maturation of junctions. And so it, here I show you three panels showing different stages of uh, junctions, what cells do when they first meet. When they first meet, nect nectins engage. and um, and then they start to recruit additional junctional proteins such as cadherins. And afadin, it's kind of vague in the literature, but it's thought to do that via these GTPases. And so this just told us, okay, maybe RAS IP1 is playing an analogous role. So I just want you to keep that in mind as we go through the rest of the talk. So David Barry decided to really take a look at this and just ask the question, what is RAS IP1 really doing? And so one of the things, the first questions he asked is he said, okay, RAS IP1 is upstream of this apical adhesion clearance and lumen formation, because we know that fails in the mutants. So how is this happening? So he thought there was two ways that this could happen, either through adhesion movement or through exocytosis. And so he wanted to test those two ideas. Either the junctions could be moved, simply moved out of the way, or they could be taken up. We know the junctions are not static on the apical membrane. They are constantly recycled and put on the surface and taken back in, and it's constant uh, treadmilling of these at the cell surface. And so maybe it was a disruption of that process, and, and maybe endocytosis was e either uh, necessary for the removal of those junctions. And so he decided to ask that question. So he used a system, and we're going to use the system throughout the talk, which is whole embryo culture. And what we're we're showing you here is a mouse and we're taking the embryos out of the mouse. Um, we're taking them within their decidua. We're putting them in these bottles uh, with media and they're uh, being cultured and they will live this way. Um, embryo, mouse embryos are very difficult to culture. They're not like frog embryos, uh, which it's easy to culture them for days. Um, Outside the mother, they do that normally, but these mouse embryos are a little bit tougher. But this whole embryo culture uh, was great because we could do it right during the time when these cords were opening up lumens, which takes about three hours. And so because we culture them, we could now use drugs uh, to query different pathways. And so in this particular case, David um, asked the question, is endocytosis critical for the process of lumen formation? So what I'm showing you here on the top uh, is a control mouse that's being cultured and lumens will open very nicely and, and naturally in this in the system. And what he did now is to add inhibitors uh, to all different types of endocytosis. In this case, I'm showing you pit stop two, which is an inhibitor of cl clathrin dependent and clathrin independent uh, endocytosis. And what he showed was that even when you treated it for uh, three hours before and during lumen opening, the lumens would open just fine. So this tended to tell us that endocytosis was not being used for this process of adhesion clearance and lumen formation. So we really started to think about the other role, which was potentially moving out of the way. And so at this point, I'll bring up some data that was actually from Kerr Zoo, but what Kerr had done was to try and understand what RAS IP1 was doing by asking who does it bind to. And he found um, a number of uh, binding partners. One was non-muscle myosin heavy chain 2A, which is a component of the actomyosin contractility machinery, which is regulated by Rho, and I'm gonna go that over that in a minute. But it also bound to R gap 29, a row gap. And then all those other bands that you see down below are breakdown products of actin. But these binding partners really form the basis for uh, us putting together a, a model about what was going on. So here's just to remind you what non muscle myosin does in its inactive state, uh, in, in a, it's in an inactive conformation, uh, that circular one at the top left. And then when it becomes phosphorylated on a regulatory myosin light chain, it opens up, it engages actin, it binds, and ATPase catalyzes the movement of those uh, heavy chains and causes contraction of that actin cytoskeleton. So non-muscle myosin has been implicated 
in the anchoring of cell adhesion points uh, within the cell. And it's also been um, well known to be involved in cell constriction, pulling on the actin and making the cell shape changes. So we got interested in non-muscle myosin in terms of what it could be doing and could it be playing a role in this clearance of these adhesion junctions. So the question became, are actomycin components at the right time in the right place to control these, these junctions. And so here I'm showing you again, those cross sections through these cords. I'm showing you junction molecules, VE cadherin, um, being across that apical surface uh, as the lumens are closed, but as they open, they clear that apical surface. And what was intriguing to us was that activated myosin light chain uh, or phosphorylated myosin light chain, then there's antibodies to this, were right on top of these junctions. That means that there was active actomyosin machinery right on top of the moving junctions. And there was also F-actin. And so if you stain for any of these components, you could see them in the right place at the right time. So were they there? Yes, they were there. Now the next question was, um, are they required for lumen formation? So we use the same whole embryo uh, culture system to simply, a bit of a sledgehammer, but simply put drugs that would inhibit either actin or non-muscle myosin. So the first one I'm showing you here is cytochalasin, which inhibits actin polymerization. And so you can see control on the left, DMSO treated versus uh, cytochalasin D treated embryos, and then cross sections through that on the bottom. And you can see now with these white arrows pointing at those junctions across the apical surface. And then, so that means F actin was important. Um, and then here I'm showing you another experiment where we use blebistatin, which is an inhibitor to non-muscle myosin. And you can see that that also blocks uh, the movement of these uh, adhesion points away from the apical lumen. So these two experiments um, essentially said, yes, it looks like actomycin machinery is important. So we became further interested, what's going on with non-muscle myosin? Where does it play its role? Is it downstream of RAS IP1 as, as we would suspect? So we took a look just in a heterozygote here, I'm showing you this active myosin light chain, phosphorylated myosin light chain, showing you where there's contractility going on. And you can see that in red and it's nicely there in the heterozygotes. And in our mutants, it's gone. It's no longer on top of these junctions. So at this point we can start to we can say, yes, it appears to be downstream of RAS IP1, and we can sort of build a model. RAS IP1 is upstream of non-muscle myosin, which is upstream of these adhesion clearance and of lumen formation. So this was really exciting, but we it didn't, it didn't give us a direct link between RAS IP1 and non-muscle myosin. That upper arrow in the model on the right, we still didn't understand. So this is what we really set out to, to take a look at. How does RAS IP1 regulate that non-muscle myosin activity to control lumen formation? So at this point, I just want to introduce you to the literature that's out there, things that not things we did, but what others did. And I mentioned that non-muscle myosin was activated by Rho. And it is. And, and so I show you that with a little cartoon here, that Rho in blue here is actually a, a catalyst. It's a molecular switch. And it's turning on this kinase called ROC or Rho kinase. And this kinase now is phosphorylating the myosin light chain. This has long been known. And it has been really implicated in cell contractility. And here I just show you an experiment where we're expressing in a cell an activated rho A molecule, constitutively active molecule, and it's causing constriction of these cells. So this pathway was known and it was intriguing to us, uh, but there were other pathways known upstream of non-muscle myosin, including CDC42 and its downstream kinase pack. And that has been implicated at cell junctions. So we were thinking in terms of this contractility and the cytoskeleton on the one hand and cell adhesions on the other hand, and which uh, GTPases were playing which role and when. And so at this point, we met actually at a NAVBO conference, uh, George Davis, um, who has long been interested in the uh, GTPases and their roles in lumen formation. And his model system is these HUVEX that are plated in these three-dimensional co collagen matrices. And he had beautiful papers, a number of them, showing that CDC42 and RAC GTPases were really critical for lumen formation, and Rho was not. So that was kind of their uh, control, unimportant GTPase. 
And so we teamed up at this point during this NAVBO meeting, and we sent him our siRNAs against RAS IP1 to just test in his system was RAS IP1 necessary. And he, he found out that it was. And so when he put RAS IP1 on in his system, it would essentially mimic uh, the CDC42 and RAC phenotype. But he went further and he took a look to see whether or not these GTPases, their activity required RAS IP1. And so here I'm just showing you um, these Westerns that are uh, showing you the activity of CDC42 and RAC. And that's sort of the top panel here. You, we're doing that with pack beads. So the expression of these GTPases was not affected, it was really the activity. Um, and Rho, on the other hand, was interestingly kind of upregulated. And he saw the same exact sort of profile with an siRNA knocking down the function of that R gap that I told you was a binding partner to RAS IP1. So this was really intriguing to us. This implicated his favorite GTPases in our process and downstream of our gene. So we, we decided to sort of press further and just in vivo asked the question, how important are CDC42 and RAC and Rho? What are they doing? But from these early uh, in, vivo, in vitro experiments, we started building the model that RAS IP1 was positively upstream of CDC42 and RAC, but negatively uh, upstream of Rho. And so at this point, um, yeah, upstream of all of the, the machinery that is going to clear these junctions. So at this point, we're deciding to sort of test this pathway and we're gonna start off on the left-hand side here and test the CDC42 pathway. So we're gonna ask the question, is CDC42 necessary for this apical adhesion clearance? And what I'm gonna show you fairly quickly here is a series of uh, either mutants or these whole embryo cultures with pharmacological agents that are going to knock out all of these pathway components just one by one. We're gonna go on the left-hand side of the model first, and then we're gonna move on to the right-hand side. So the first experiment that David did was just to knock out CDC42 genetically uh, in these early cords. And so I'm showing you here again, either a heterozygote where there's one copy of CDC42, lumens form fine, versus uh, CDC42 knockout within these cords um, in a homozygous manner. And you can see that these early aorta, if you knock it out early enough, uh, will not clear their apical junctions. So then he went down the pathway and just asked questions, is PAC required, that kinase that is known uh, to phosphorylate um, mice and light chain. And we saw that the inhibitor would do the same thing and would block the migration of these junctions out of the way. So this implicated positively the CDC42 pathway upstream of, of these junctions. Um, now we wanted to ask, is the activity of myosin light chain, is it really changed in these? And so he did the same exact thing, knocked out CDC42, and now he's assaying in red for phosphorylated mice and light chain. And you can see that that activity is gone. Those junctions, uh, we know where they are. They're not moving out of the way, uh, but they're not on top of that phosphorylated mice and light chain. And the same thing when you use that inhibitor against the pack. So that means CDC42 is, is in a positive way required for junctional clearance. So then we wanted to go to the other side and ask about Rho. Is the Rho pathway important? In his system, he said, it's not important at all. If you knock it out in vitro, you never see a phenotype. So we decided to do that in the same way with either genetic or pharmacological treatments. And so when he knocked out Rho, what he found was actually, it wasn't important at all for adhesion clearance, but it was important for something uh, because the lumens uh, were really huge after a removal of Rho A. And it was the same thing when we use a rock inhibitor, lumens were really large. Um, and so, in fact, the row pathway was not important for luminal clearance, but it was important for some aspect of lumen formation since the lumens were really big. So this helped us clarify the two sides of, of the coin, um, both pathways that are known to be upstream of non-muscle myosin, one positive, one negative. So we, we were like confused, how could that be? that non-muscle myosin would have opposite roles on the same process. And the answer really came with this experiment. So I'm gonna show you two blebistatin experiments, one done prior to lumen opening, which I've told you before blocks lumen formation, and then one done after lumen opening. So if you take an embryo, you, you, you treat it with blebistatin, 
you find that in fact the lumens open fine but they open way too big and so what we think is actually we've caught a, a spatiotemporal difference in the use of ras ip1 and non-muscle myosin on the left hand side it's a positive role ras ip1 is acting upstream of cdc42 and non-muscle myosin on the right hand side here later ras ip1 is doing something completely different uh, using roe and non-muscle myosin and so i summarize that here with this model um, at first, the in number one here, the angioblasts meet, they form junctions, uh, and then they establish uh, these apical uh, cell adhesion points. And then in three, non-muscle myosin actually, in a positive way, via CDC42 and PAC, helps them move out of the way. And it's, it's not really a kind of a lateral movement like I show here. These actually kind of form ribbons along the long axis of the tube, and these retract and get much smaller as that non-muscle myosin contracts. In four here, I show you that non-muscle myosin, uh, at this point, we think the heart starts to beat, blood starts to fill in those lumens, and that puts pressure on the apical wall. And we know, we actually know that this happens, that uh, actin accumulates, and non-muscle myosin is important for resisting that blood flow. So why would we need RAS IP1 at this point? At this point, we think that RAS IP1 via RGAP29 is actually suppressing row A, suppressing ROC, suppressing non-muscle myosin activity, allowing, and I have this mislabeled here, it should be five, but allowing non-muscle myosin to be in, inhibited at this point, to allow the expansion of those cells, the thinning of those cells, um, and allow that tube to grow, because we know that during development, uh, blood vessels tubes will grow. And so this model you know, brings together the same upstream molecule, RAS IP1, the same downstream mo molecule, non-muscle myosin, but opposite roles. In one case, we're encouraging constriction, in the other case, we're suppressing constriction. So just in these last few slides here, and I'm wrapping it up, I'm a little bit over time, why does RAS IP1 matter? Uh, we contend, and this was work of Jan Ku here, uh, that it's really important for formation of these uh, early tubes. And what I've discussed up until now is vasculogenic tubule formation uh, in these early cords. But what Jan wanted to do was to test whether or not it was also required during angiogenesis, which is the sprouting of new tubes. And that is really a formation of a lumen in a different manner. Uh, than what happens when cells just move their junctions out of the way. They really have to remodel them during angiogenesis. So she did a number of different assays, two of which were published in the angiogenesis pa uh, paper that we mentioned earlier. And what she did was to ask the question, in an adult uh, that you have uh, removed RAS IP1 usually using conditional ablation, and so here I'm just showing you that we take mice after birth about four weeks, uh, that have a conditional allele, we tamoxifen it, we get rid of RAS IP1, we demonstrate RAS IP1 is really gone, and now we're going to ask how does angiogenesis, uh, what does it do, or do, do, does it form fine, do vessels, new vessels form fine, and angiogenesis is very rare in the adult mouse, and therefore we can test that by putting these little matrigel implants under the skin, and vessel, new vessels will grow into those matrigel implants. And so we're asking the question, is RAS IP1 required for that, that uh, role? And so we now, I have a picture here showing you either a heterozygote or a homozygote that has been knocked out for RAS IP1, uh, the blood vessels within that matrigel implant. And what we found was that it was uh, significantly uh, inhibited uh, that process of angiogenesis. And similarly, actually in the early eye, it's postnatal, but it's not adult. When the eye is growing, the retinal vasculature is a great place to take a look at uh, new vessels and new vessel formation and new lumens. And here, what I'm showing you on the left-hand side is a is a, a, a mouse that doesn't have Cre, that's basically our control mouse. And uh, Jan has injected a, fluore a, dextran, a fluorescent dextran within the vasculature. And so the green that you're seeing here is really the lumens. It's coursing through all those vessels. And on the right-hand side is a mouse that uh, RAS IP1 has been knocked out. 
uh, using a, a in conditional inducible CRE. And what we can see is that that dextran doesn't perfuse as, as far, and all those vessels that you can see in red have not opened up these lumens properly. And so this just means that RAS IP1 not only is required during early vascular genesis, but later during angiogenesis and new vessel formation, uh, since they don't seem to be opening up normally. And so this is the process here, uh, that early retinal bed, which expands and grows in these new blood vessels, oops, and here is just an example of how that inhibits not only uh, lumen formation, but also uh, the expansion of this vascular bed. Um, and in these conditional knockouts of RAS IP1, they don't uh, expand a, as well. And in fact, behind the front, uh, they're more dense. So that here's just a model to kind of bring that last little part together. The top part is vasculogenesis, which requires this RAS IP1 to clear these junctions. The bottom part is angiogenesis and how these new sprouts open up these lumens in a different manner, but they still do it via reorganization of these junctions and they fail to do that normally when RAS IP1 is gone. So at this point, I just want to kind of bring it together and say that, you know, we're still studying RAS IP1. We're still interested. There's lots of open questions, but RAS IP1, we think, coordinates really this junction localization uh, for proper lumen formation via uh, initially the placement of these tight junctions in the right place at the right time, most likely via these contractility of the cytos and the cytoskeleton movement of these junctions. But when RAS IP1 is gone, uh, it controls these GTPases. There's too much rho. These cells have internal contractility, but not in the right place at the right time. The junctions are all in the right wrong place, and therefore the lumens never open up properly. So I'll end it here. I'm a little over time. I just want to make a, a special thank you to Angiogenesis for uh, funding this uh, first episode of our, uh, our experimental episode of the, the webinar series. I also want to thank all the lovely people in my lab who have done the work. Um, lots of people working on different aspects of development, including pancreas development, kidney development, and blood vessel development. In particular, I talked about David Berry and Ker Zhu's work here. Um, and I'll stop there and take any questions. And, and and Jan's work. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. I will end there. So I think maybe at this point, are you there, Bernadette, to take questions? I don't hear anybody. I see Linda coming on. All right. For, for our attendees, just patient. be patient a minute while Caitlin, we- Caitlin, do you have the questions? Yes, I'm here. Um, I'd like to thank, this is Caitlin Brach. I'd like to thank Dr. Cleaver for the excellent seminar. And we have some good questions coming in. I'd ask the attendees to continue um, asking questions. They can click the raised hand button if they think of other questions. Okay, the first one is in earlier slides showing the effects of RAS IP1 knockout on embryonic vessel lumen formation. You showed that the surrounding tissue made room for the endothelial cells that never came. What drives this clearance process in the surrounding tissue? Yeah, that's really interesting. And I didn't go over it in this talk. I'm rushing to that slide. And it's, it's a really interesting process. Um, I, I didn't believe it at first, but we got really interested in how that initial hole kind of opens up. Um, the mesenchyme actually opens up a lumen, even if the endothelial cells aren't there. Now that might seem surprising, but that mesenchyme is actually sclerotome and it's gonna end up forming cartilage. It's gonna end up forming some, some bone. So it's gonna form some structures. And so what we did actually to test this, what we took uh, these uh, VEGF receptor two null mice that have no endothelial cells. And we took a look at that hole and it appears. So why do your question is, why do the endothelial cells let go of that mesenchyme that is opening up that tube? Um, and we demonstrated, although I didn't go over it here, that in fact, when you screw up the uh, actin cytoskeleton and that uh, contractility, you also mess up the, uh, anchoring of beta-1 junctions to the ECM, uh, which is coding that lumen. And so if you were to do a stain, say, for fibronectin or for collagen, you would see it coding that cavity that's opening up. Um, and that adhesion between the endothelial cells fails. So we showed that beta-1 and actually beta-3 integrins, their activity, not their presence, but their activity was severely impaired. And we think that that has something to do with inside-out signaling. 
So I hope I hope that answers the question. Okay, thanks. Okay, for the next question, um, the listener said they've learned a lot about how the endothelial lumens are formed. But they're asking, is there anything inside the lumen, such as proteins or extracellular matrix molecules or blood or other fluid? Yeah, oh, absolutely. So this is a, another great question. I mean, we, we obviously it's not air, right? And so the question is, what's in there? What's in those lumens? And we think actually that endothelial cells must do very similar things to what the early blastocyst embryo does. For a while in the blastocyst, when sperm meets egg and you have cleavage and you end up with a morula, all those cells are all piled up on top of each other. But at a certain point, they cavitate. And that's been studied extensively. So we went back and looked at this process of cavitation and solute carriers are incredibly important for pumping in fluid. They also have to move junctions around to be able to open up a central lumen, uh, but that fluid pumping is critical. So in the early blood vessels, we know at first there's no blood, there's plasma. Where is that plasma coming from? I mean, that's a great question. How does it get in there? What solute carriers are important? We know nothing. So that's a all open-ended questions. We started looking at which solute carriers were expressed in these other endothelial cells, and there's like hundreds. <laughs> so we've been a bit stymied on going in that direction, but we really should. Good question. Okay, thanks. Um, and another question, I think you could maybe just remind us, you went, mentioned this in the talk, I think, but what exactly is upstream of RAS-IP1? Ah, yeah, that's another good question. I mean, we don't know is the answer. Uh, it's one of the first genes that turns on along with VEGF receptor 2, ETV2, uh, and a number of other uh, endothelial specific genes. We looked in the promoter and we can see ETV2 um, and, and KLF binding sites. So we think that the master regulator ETV2 is likely turning on its expression. We have not tested that, uh, but we predict that that's going to be true. And it's something we should look into. We just haven't. Good okay, question. cool. Um, I don't see anyone with the raised hand for another question. I'll ask one more and to give people time to ask questions or else this could be the last one. So oh. I was just wondering if you've um, looked at other candidates from your E8.25 screen and it's kind of amazing how uh, severe the RAS IP1 de defect was and if yeah. you saw um, similar, if your other candidate genes were redundant or if they all there are others like RAS IP1. Yeah, you know, it's funny because when I, I first started my faculty position <laughs> with this long list and I really I had it up on my wall and I was excited. I thought, oh, it's a treasure trove and, you know, I'll just knock them out one by one and they'll all be critical. And but we actually ended up knocking out a few and they did not have roles um you know, that were a bottleneck like RAS IP1. I mean, in some ways, I think we got lucky with RAS IP1. Mm -hmm. uh, we knocked out, for instance, ESM was one we knocked out and, and it didn't have a, a role in early vessel formation or patterning or lumen formation or anything like that. Um, we, we have watched over the years, people knock out some of these molecules. I mean, you saw some of them listed uh, earlier on, so I could, maybe I can point out some of them here. FGD5 was one great example, uh, ARAP3, um, RASA1, and there've been knockouts of all of these molecules and they have, actually they have various effects on, on the endothelium. So in some ways we've been scooped. <laughs> in other mm -hmm. ways, uh, these, these list of genes have actually, uh, been found by other people. And so I saw this great poster by Waylon Yi from Genentech a long time ago. And what it was, was actually a, um, uh, gosh, they took tip cells in the retinal bed and they did laser capture and then they did microarrays on those cells. And their list was almost identical to my list. And my list came from an early aorta. So somehow I think what they were looking at were these activated endothelial cells that were in the process of forming new blood vessels. And that's really what our endothelial cells are in that early aorta. So I was shocked at how our lists were identical. But mm -hmm. yeah, over the years, a lot of these have pr proven to be important, not always during the initial steps, but sometimes during the later steps uh, of angiogenesis, new blood vessel formation during angiogenesis. Okay, great, thank you. Um, 
I don't see any other questions coming up. Oh wait, sorry, here's one. Are there any reports of RASIP1 mutations in human vascular disease? Um, no, and I've been, I always say I stock the OMIM uh, page on, on uh, NCBI, and so far, no. And the only thing I can guess is that it's a really unique bottleneck. And so my worry is that perhaps a mutation of RAS IP1 just leads to death. And so mm -hmm. that's why you don't find it. Uh, but no, and I've been, trust me, I've been looking. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Um... Okay, I'd like to thank Dr. Cleaver once again, and I will turn it over to Bernadette or Linda, I believe. All thank right, you. thanks, Caitlin. Bernadette or Linda. I see people blinking in and out. Well, before Linda or Bernadette sort of log on and, and come back to us, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. Take an hour out of your day. I hope it was interesting. And don't hesitate to email me if you have any additional questions about uh, the, the webinar, OK? All right, I am back. All right. I'd like to, once, this is Linda. I would like, once again, to thank Andine Cleaver and her associate, Caitlin Brach, for their participation in our first webinar. I'd like to thank all of you for attending. I hope you found this information beneficial and will join us again for a webinar on April 5th when Jessica Wagenseal of Washington University will present her research entitled Elastic Fibers and the Mechanics of Maturing Arteries. Then again on May 3rd for a presentation from Christopher Hughes of the University of California at Irvine on a perfused blood-brain barrier on a chip. Just a note, please fill out the evaluation form at the end of the webinar or when you receive it in a subsequent email and let us know of any questions or topics you may want to see in a NAVBO webinar presentation. Thank you so much and we've run out of time. Um, please join us again. Thank you.